This is a study that we did. Um, actually, Howard and I started about 10 years ago, uh, keeping track of fatalities that were temporally associated with IV. Notice temporally associated uh, as opposed to assuming a causal association. Uh, but uh, basically, Howard and I started uh, collecting this data. Uh, every time there was a death, sometimes I was privy to it, sometimes Howard, sometimes both of us. Basically, we kept track of these cases. Uh, a couple years ago, I approached the medical examiner's office in the city of New York, uh, the OCME's office, Office of Chief Medical Examiner, uh, and worked with their overdose expert. And uh, recently, we presented this data at a forensic toxicology meeting. Uh, it's now been submitted for publication. We found since 1992, December of 2008, uh, December 2008, we were beginning to feel that we no longer had, just like with the eth ethnography paper, uh, we knew that we were basically losing track, uh, losing touch with the proliferating uh, Ibogaine uh, treatment settings. Uh, so basically, we terminated data collection at that point. Very interesting, in 2008, there were no deaths. Uh, the, you know, the last year, it sort of ended happily. Uh, we have 19 cases. Uh, the age, the average age was uh, almost 40 years old. The time interval from ingestion of ibogaine to death was about 24 hours, uh, which is interesting considering that the half-life of ibogaine itself, uh, prior to its conversion to ibogaine, is about four to seven hours. Uh, so it may not be related to the, you know, there may not be a differential in terms of the toxic implications of ibogaine or noribogaine per se, what we found also is that um, whether ibogaine was given as the hydrochloride uh, or the, uh, the, uh, al the al alkaloid extract or bark seemed to make somewhat of a difference, but mainly, mainly what we found is that the risk factors for ibogaine related, for deaths that are temporally related to ibogaine are the same medical risk factors for overdose. People at risk for overdose tend to be older. They tend to have cardiac or hepatic or pulmonary disease. Um, not just anybody is dying from overdoses. They are a medically at risk population and we found very similar risk factors uh, for Ibogaine, uh, te deaths temporally related to Ibogaine as for, other over, uh, as for overdoses in general. Um, the number of cases where Ibogaine was used in the indication of detoxification, no surprise, 15 and 19. Postmortem toxicology analysis for commonly abused drugs. There were 11 cases where we had this data available. Eight were positive. Uh, and then uh, the total number of cases, uh, basically what we used is kind of a formalistic approach. Um, there is something called a proximate cause of death, which is the thing that actually kills the patient like a pulmonary embolism, and then there are contributing causes of death. Uh, you know, for example, uh, a cardiomyopathy in the case of somebody who dies uh, from an arrhythmia. Um, so basically what we had, what we did, is I had the medical examiner uh, provide a formal judgment because um, we had a number of sources of this data. In some of the cases, the autopsy reports were superb. They were really detailed, uh, particularly ones from the Netherlands. Uh, and there were, and, and also the United States as well. Those were the good ones. Um, there were other autopsies that were really not informative of all, like some of the ones from Mexico. So basically, what we had the medical examiner do is determine the proximate and contributing causes of death using the criteria that he usually uses. So we had one consistent interpretation across all these studies that span a huge geographic uh, location and two decades. Um, so the cases where the adequate data was considered to be available, there was 14 of 19 cases. And in 12 of those cases, we found a, an, exam, an, an advanced pre-existing medical comorbidity, comorbidity that was either a contributing or proximal cause of the death or, and or commonly abused substances approximately or contributing to the death. So there were 12 cases of 14 where there was an identifiable medical cause or a toxicological cause that would cause it to be ruled as an overdose. The two remaining cases, one involved the cell administration of ground root bark, uh, something like 18 teaspoons, which is a lot, 
Uh, and this person had the second highest levels of Ibogaine in the entire series, and those were measured about 50 hours out. So there is apparently very high bioavailability from root bark. Um, and then the other one involved uh, alkaloid extract. So what you had in these two deaths was basically the common element of people using ethnopharmacological forms without much information on how to use them or what it was that they were using. Uh, so we didn't find anyone who was perfectly healthy, used hydrochloride, and didn't use drugs during the treatment. Uh, so, you know, the conclusions in terms of risk factors here. Um, these, uh, these, uh, so we're looking at the, the range was basically one and a half to 76 hours. Um, we, the, the major themes that emerge are significant pre-existing medical, particularly cardiac disease. Uh, and we're talking about serious stuff, a recent MI, myocardial infarction, like three months before the death or a cardiomy dilated cardiomyopathy where the heart was twice the size, twice the weight it should have been. One of these deaths involved alcohol, probably involved in alcohol withdrawal seizures. Uh, and then, um, as we said, IV will not prevent seizures due to withdrawal from benzos or alcohol. Uh, and um, Ibogaine is um, also in the presence of a seizure. Seizures themselves, by themselves, prolong QT, so there's probably a synergy. Uh, and then also, uh, on that subject, mentioning this Dutch um, case that was written up in the New England Journal of Medicine in March of 09, or February of 09, it was published. Um, I have interviewed the treatment provider at length, obsessively at length, who was, I think, extraordinarily patient with me with me asking her the same questions over months and taking copious notes. She was tr seeking treatment for alcohol dependence and probably had been drinking up to 36 hours before she, was, uh, before she had the seizure-like attack uh, that caused her to be transported to the hospital. Why did they call this a seizure-like attack instead of an alcohol withdrawal seizure is a really good question. Um, the patient was also bulimic, uh, so that could put have been attributed to the mild electrolyte abnormalities that were found on admission. She had a history of cocaine use. She was not cocaine positive at the time that she was seen, but she had this history. Uh, and stimulant users often acquire cardiac uh, problems um, that put them at risk uh, for treatment with Ibogaine. Um, so, you know, the title of this article was that this was ibogaine induced, uh, and a lot of these medical, you know, these medical risks were sort of, you know, passed over, uh, including calling, a, you know, what was clinically obviously an alcohol withdrawal seizure a seizure-like attack. You know, not, you know, sort of glossing over the fact that the patient was in alcohol withdrawal. Alcohol withdrawal seizures are, in, in a, additionally. In addition to the seizures prolonging QT, alcohol withdrawal seizures also prolong the QT. Uh, so, you know, this, this patient uh, survived, but uh, there were numerous uh, risk factors that were either de-emphasized or not emphasized in this report. Pulmonary embolism was reported in a couple of, in some of the cases. These were the Mexican cases, and it's really, it's too bad because those autopsies, you know, basically if you don't do the autopsy, and demonstrate the, the presence of the embolus, then it's hard to make a definitive diagnosis of pulmonary embolism. On the other hand, where you have a clinical picture where this patient suddenly becomes out of breath and you get a sudden desaturation of their blood gases, that is the clinical picture of a pulmonary embolism. And that clinical picture is much more often uh, falsely uh, negative than falsely positive. In other words, their that picture, the post-mortem deaths to, to pulmonary embolism are commonly missed. And usually when a physician thinks he saw a PE, then they turn out to be correct. Unfortunately, all of those pulmonary embolism cases were among the five that the medical examiner felt there was insufficient evidence. One of them actually had a family history of pulmonary embolism, and there are familial uh, a, a, a diathesis that produce, you know, predispose people to pulmonary embolism <coughs> risk. Use of opiates or stimulants during treatment, obviously a risk factor. That involves um, you know, knowing the patient, observing what they do, um, and then use of indigenous forms by, forms by people who really uh, didn't know about them. I would say there's one overriding risk factor for all the providers to remember. There was a recurrent theme here 
is that in many cases, providers had someone show up or someone put pressure on them to do a treatment under circumstances they normally wouldn't do. They kind of bent their own rules. They were taken out of their game. Uh, and I would emphasize that, you know, and frequently there's patients with family issues or personality disorders. If you have an established set of rules, don't make exceptions. Uh, because very frequently it was people getting out of their own approach, getting out of their usual protocol where th bad things happen. And that's kind of a, you know, an indefinite warning. I can't, I, that doesn't manifest itself in one particular way, but that was a recurrent theme, I would say, in at least five or six of these deaths. Now, what's also interesting in these cases, we saw 11 deaths in 05 and 06. We saw three in 07 and none in 08. And I think, and that's even as the number of treatments probably expanded. So there's an ending here you know, that is kind of uh, encouraging, uh, which is, and I think it's a real effect. Uh, I think that you know, that statistical effect is real. And I think what it represents is the widespread adoption of exclusion <laughs> criteria and pretreatment evaluation. Um, I think prevention is still the key here, knowing you know, who to treat, having some guidelines of who, and, and involving uh, internists and medical physicians in the pre-treatment evaluation. Uh, so I think that, you know, and this is something that is, you know, recommended, for example, in the IVD treatment manual that you, you uh, Boaz and, and Howard were involved with, you know, um, there's a lot of emphasis on pre-treatment evaluation. And I think I saw uh, some of the providers um, take a much more uh, positive stance towards uh, pre-treatment evaluation and view of experiences with themselves and, uh, and others.